All right, good evening, everybody. Sorry for the delay. We appreciate you being here. Uh, my name's Andy Parton. I'm the president of the Cradle of Aviation Museum. And uh, on behalf of everybody, we appreciate you coming out for another in our continuing celebration of our countdown to Apollo at 50. Um, in case you didn't notice, countdown clock continues in the atrium. Uh, there's only so many days, so many hours, and so many minutes before the 50th anniversary on July 20th. And uh, as a brief commercial, let me tell you what we've got upcoming. Uh, on June 6th, we're going to have our anniversary dinner to honor all the Apollo astronauts and all the missions. That will be on June 6th. Right now, and we are adding Apollo astronauts as we go, Walt Cunningham of Apollo 7, Rusty Schweikert of Apollo 9, Fred Hayes of Apollo 13, and Flight Director Jerry Griffin. Uh, have all committed and we're just waiting for a few more folks to commit. On July 20th we'll be holding two events. The first will be an Apollo Moon Festival which will be all day long and it will include a variety of family friendly activities, rocket launches, astronaut encounters with Long Island shuttle astronauts, um, a variety of things. In addition we're going to do a countdown to the landing which took place about 4.40 in the afternoon. Uh, and to do that, hopefully it's going to work, but uh, we're going to be lowering the very large model of the LEM from the ceiling of the atrium down, and we're all going to count down to that event. Then in the evening, we're going to have a, uh, let's call it a lighthearted 1960s themed dinner uh, and dance with a 60s band, uh, and then we will do a, a New Year's Eve type countdown to Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. And on big screens, we're going to show the enhanced footage of Neil Armstrong taking those steps at the exact moment 50 years ago. So more to come on those things. And um, keep checking the website, because we'll have a lot of information uh, as we get closer. But it's coming up pretty quickly. Tonight, we're honored to have with us Space Shuttle astronaut Bob Senker, who will share with you his experiences in space, including some of the more humorous sides of space travel. Bob Senker, is, uh, by trade, is an aerospace and electrical engineer who served as a mission specialist on Columbia STS-61C. That crew included, among others, Long Islander, who we've had here a number of times, Commander Hoot Gibson, former NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden, and former U.S. Senator, and at the time was a congressman, Bill Nelson from Florida. The mission traveled over 2.5 million miles over its six-day mission, and he logged over 146 hours in space his primary role on the shuttle was his work with the RCA Astro Electronics and the launch of the SATCOM K program. His mission was the last mission before the Challenger disaster and was called the end of innocence for the space shuttle program. After his mission, he returned to work in the commercial aerospace field where he still is working today. Please join me in welcoming space shuttle astronaut Bob Senker. Good evening, everyone. I will add my apologies for, for running late. That was a, a big part of that was my fault. I, got, I had an interview and just things ran longer than, than we expected them to run. What I would like to do for you tonight is talk to you about my experience on the space shuttle. I normally call this presentation Life in Space uh, because one of the guys that I flew with once told me that no matter what you talk about when you're an astronaut, people really want to know what's it like to live there. And, and so that's what I'll do. And I, and I normally introduce this with the, uh, with the comment that life in space is exactly the same as it is here. <laughs> Only different. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go into that in, in, in some amount of detail. And, and after I'm done, I hope to be able to answer as many of your questions as we can get to. So, so I'm going to ask you to kind of hold your thoughts if you have any questions, and we'll try to get to those at the end. I'm also going to apologize before I start because I'm not used to a venue like this. This is mind-boggling. I've never spoken in a situation like this. And I would like to also add, this is, this is a celebration of Apollo, and I, and I certainly share that. And, and a number of questions that I've gotten was, you know, how did, how did that affect your life? And clearly it did. I was, I was 20 years old when Apollo landed, and I, had, I was heading towards my senior year at Penn State for my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, and, and I wore glasses, so I didn't know that I was ever going to be an astronaut. I knew I wanted to be involved in the space program, but, but that was sort of a, a thing that came afterwards after the shuttle. But, but more importantly, personally, 
and I'm going to embarrass my, my, my good wife, Barbara, when I asked her to marry me, it was, the five, it was the week after the fifth anniversary of the landing on the moon. She says, well, at least I know you'll never forget our anniversary. <laughs> that, that day is burned into my head. So what I would like to do, as I said, is talk to you about what it's like to live in space. But before I do that, because I'm, I'm guessing that no one here has ever been on the space shuttle before, I'll give you a short walkthrough of what that's like. This is the space shuttle Columbia, and this was one of the pictures taken before one of our many launch attempts. We set the record for launch delays. I got on the vehicle five times before I got to fly. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience because every time you get in the vehicle, it's two or three hours, and so you climb up into the cabin, and it's a rather long, involved process, and I'll concentrate on life in space, so I won't get into that. This is the crew cabin. When you see the photos, you're going to see us in what looks like a relatively small room. And I'm going to guess that most of you have probably flown, or certainly a lot of you have flown commercially, and the shuttle is the size of an airliner. And if you compare that into, to the pictures, then you're going to say, well, what happened to the rest of it? And the part of the shuttle that we actually lived in was this part right up here on the top. It's called the crew cabin. And that was the only habitable part. The back, the rest of it down the side was the cargo bay. And that was where all of the stuff that we took with us in space was stored. It's like the back of the truck. It's where you do all the work. And the crew lives on the top. So before I get into my photographs, because I'm sure nobody knows what that looks like, this is a drawing of the inside of the space shuttle. If I'm going to break this, I apologize in advance. I do it often. This is downstairs. This is the part where I actually lived in. If you look right here, you can see these seats. You will not see those seats anywhere in the photographs that I, told, that I show you because those seats are not a permanent part of the shuttle. This drawing shows the shuttle sitting on the ground. So when you stand it up for launch, those chairs are hanging from the wall. Because they're hanging from the wall, they weigh 90 pounds. NASA does not want to fly those seats if there's nobody there to use them. So they're not a permanent part of the structure. It tests your faith in engineering when you realize they're attached to the floor with quick disconnects. They're like bayonet mounts. So on the ride up, stand this up for launch, and I'm hanging on the wall in a 90-pound chair by four quick disconnects. And I'm hanging there, and I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I'm an engineer. I know we can do this. And it's worked 23 times before this. I was the 24th flight of the program. You see here these lockers. Because you are hanging on the wall, those little boxes, uh, for the young folks in here, hark back to your kindergarten years. Remember in kindergarten when you had a cubby? You had a little box. Those were our cubbies. Everything that we needed to take with us in space was packed in one of those boxes. One of those boxes had nothing in it but my clothes. One of those, two or three of those boxes had nothing in it but food. So everything was packed in those lockers. And you'll see photos of the lockers when I get into the flight. If you look really carefully right here, you can see waste collection system compartment. The only reason I point that out is because everybody asks about the bathroom. <laughs> That arrow, the waste collection system compartment, is government speak for the bathroom. And if you look carefully, you can see that panel doesn't go to the ceiling and it doesn't go to the floor. The bathroom in the space shuttle was tiny. It was about the size of this lectern. So when you sat in the bathroom, your feet are hanging outside the bathroom. So you can't close the door behind you. The bathroom door gets propped open and it stays open for the duration of the flight. And, and Everybody wants to know, well, that doesn't sound like much fun. There is a privacy curtain to hang around the open bathroom door, but we'll talk more about that when we get to the photos. The side hatch is right here, and you can see what looks to be a little round feature there. That's the hatch that we get into the door. One very observant young school lady once asked me, a schoolgirl asked me, she said, if you can't close the bathroom door, why do they put a door on the bathroom? Good question, because when you stand the shuttle up for launch, that's the floor. You have to crawl across the bathroom door to climb up on the wall to get into your seat. So that's the only reason the door is there. And finally, if you look very carefully, here, here you can see the galley, and that's where the meals were prepared, and we'll talk more about the food in a moment. And if you look carefully, you can see what looks like a ladder. Here that ladder goes upstairs, and you can see the ladder now popping up through the floor. This is the upstairs on the space shuttle. This is the flight deck. 
And again, if you've flown commercially, you walk in and you can look across and see the cockpit. If the door happens to be open, that doesn't often happen anymore. But you see all the instruments. The, the cockpit on the shuttle is exactly the same as the cockpit of an airliner, only the instruments refer to rocket engines, not jet engines. And so it's a very similar kind of process. There's more redundancy. Everything on the, the space shuttle was what they call doubly redundant. When I work on a communication satellite, when I work on a satellite, it's what we call singly redundant. You can lose anything and the spacecraft will still work. Because the space shuttle was a manned vehicle, it had to be doubly redundant. You had to lose two of anything and it would still work because they didn't want to take a chance with life and limb. So those were all the instruments. And if you look carefully, you can see the displays, the cockpits. This is the commander and the pilot seat. They did fly the shuttle. The shuttle was not flown by computers. Technically, I've been told it could be, but Hoot and Charlie are my pilot and my, my commander and my pilot were two of the best pilots in, in the country, and they did fly the vehicle on the way back down when it's aerodynamic. On the ride up, it's a rocket. It's ballistic. It is controlled by the computer. And the two seats back here are called mission specialist seats. For the young people in here, a lot of people have asked me about becoming an astronaut. How do they get to go into space? A lot of people think you have to be a pilot to become an astronaut in any way, shape, or form. You've got to be a... That is not correct. The formal requirement to become an astronaut is a college degree in any area of science, technology, or education. So if you're interested in math, you can become an astronaut. There is a gentleman, Mario Ronco. I saw his picture down here. Apparently, he's from New York. Mario was a weatherman for the New Jersey State Police before he became an astronaut. Okay, so the mission specialist, because they have a college degree, because they have shown that they can be trained, that they can learn things, they learned enough about the shuttle systems. They're not pilots. They're not going to do any joystick stuff, but they're flight engineers. They have learned the subsystems. If things are working or not working, they know how to read computer screens. They know how to check data. They support the pilot and the commander in flying the vehicle, and, and it's a responsibility that works very well. This is the aft flight deck. This is looking back into the payload bay doors, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of that later on. Okay, no more drawings. This is our official in-orbit portrait. And if you don't recognize me, imagine my younger brother. Okay, that, that picture is 30-some years old. And, and I defy any of you to look at a picture of yourself that's 30 years old and say you look exactly the same as you did 30 years ago. Uh, so that is me, and this is Bill Nelson. Bill was, as, as the as introduction, this was the uh, congressman from the state of Florida. This is Charlie Bolden, former NASA Administrator, and this is Hoot Gibson, Test Pilot in the Navy. This is Pinky Nelson, Franklin Chang Diaz, and Steve Hawley. They're all astronomers. There's not a pilot in the three of them. Okay, you don't have to be a pilot. Their degrees were all in astronomy or astrophysicists, astrophysics, excuse me. And it turns out Hawley's comet was visible when we were in orbit. So NASA put three astronomers on our flight to get the best possible view of the comet from above the Earth's atmosphere. So that was the reason that they got selected for this flight. This is Charlie. Charlie is getting ready for landing here. And whenever I show up at schools, and the kids will look at me and, and gee, the uniform is kind of cool, but if you wore in your spacesuit, that would have been slick. Comes as a surprise. Some of you may recall in the early days of the program, in the last flights of the shuttle, actually post-Challenger, they wore orange suits. They called them pumpkin suits simply because of the color, and people thought they were spacesuits. They were not spacesuits. Those were partial pressure suits. Those, those were uniforms similar to the ones worn by uh, high-altitude jet pilots, U-2 pilots, SR-71 pilots. It provides an atmosphere of sorts if there should be a loss of pressure, but it was not a spacesuit. You could not go out. The shuttle provided what is a shirt sleeve environment. Any one of you could have gotten in the shuttle wearing the clothes you're wearing right now and flown. It is a true shirt sleeve environment. This uniform is a uniform that happens to be fire retardant to provide, again, a level of protection. But technically, as far as the environment goes, the shuttle is the same as flying in a commercial airliner. Actually, it's even better. Your ears don't even pop in the shuttle, except on the ground. Your ears pop on the ground because to know that the shuttle is not going to leak on the ride up, they actually pressurize it on the ground. So during the countdown, if you ever watch, they would, they would pressurize the cabin for about 10 minutes, pop it up about 10 PSI above one atmosphere, and make sure it didn't leak. And so when they did that, your ears would pop. 
But when they went back down to one atmosphere, then you go off into orbit, and it was kept at one atmosphere for the duration of the flight. The one thing that you needed special, and you had to have one of these, was the helmet. And I say you had to have one of these because the primary goal of this helmet isn't just to protect your head. One of the primary goals is to protect your hearing. If you ever get a chance to see a launch, the closest NASA will let you get is about four miles away. People often ask, what's it like on the ride up? It's loud. When we build a satellite, and I do a lot of that, one of the things that we do to test it is we put it in a chamber and surround it by speakers loud enough to break it. And I have broken metal with, not, with noise. I'm not talking about pieces of crystal glass here. I'm talking about metal structures you can break with the noise. That's how loud it is. So you have to protect your hearing. It's not enough to just cover your ears because the sound would get transmitted through your skull. If you look at the helmet, you can see that these helmets, because you're not wearing a space suit or a pressure suit, if you look at it carefully, it comes under your chin. You can't just put that down over your head, it won't fit. There is a hinge on the top of the helmet. You open up the back shell of the helmet, you drop your chin down inside it, and you clamp the back down around the back of your head. Now your head is completely surrounded by the padding. And when they called it T minus four minutes, if you recall from a launch at T minus four minutes, they would call visors down. And when they called visors down at T minus four minutes, you see this orange hose coming from the back. That orange hose brought air from the shuttle's air supply and it inflated the inside of the helmet to essentially seal your head inside there to keep the sound out. Now because you're sealed in there, you've got two earphones built in, you've got two microphones in, but the helmet basically kept the sound out. You could hear what was going on through the earphones, you could speak, but the helmet did an incredible job of keeping the sound out and protecting your hearing. I have no idea when this picture was taken. It's been a long, long time. But I can tell you with certainty it wasn't taken on flight day one. And the reason I can tell you it wasn't taken on flight day one is because I'm smiling. <laughs> have any of you ever heard the term space sickness? Yeah. A lot of people come up to me and say, oh, I could never go in space, I get airsick. We tend to associate space flight as being the ultimate air travel. Therefore, space sickness must be the ultimate in air sickness. And people have this image of astronauts throwing up all over the cabin. And it does not happen. Very few people get sick in space. Everyone that goes into space has symptoms of space adaptation syndrome which again sounds like another government speak for, for something nasty, it really is adaptation. As you're sitting there right now, you feel something on your bottoms. You stand up, you'll feel something on the bottoms of your feet. If you lay down, you feel something on your back. You go into space, you feel nothing. Sensory deprivation is a common symptom of space adaptation syndrome. I had a serious case of space adaptation. That was one of my many symptoms. Uh, it doesn't feel like you're touching anything. The first night, I actually, there were loops of canvas that you taped into the floor so that you could keep yourself from floating away if you were doing something. First night, I actually put my arm in one of those loops all the way up to my shoulder so I could feel something on my back so that I could fall asleep. Now, I can sleep anywhere, anytime, in any situation. This was weird for me not to be able to sleep. It has nothing to do with being sick. It has to do with getting used to zero G. The good news is, for you young people, it is adaptation. We are incredibly adaptable as a species. And by the middle of flight day two, or morning, mid-morning on flight day two, I was fine. It didn't bother me that I wasn't touching anything at all. And I've been told, that since I've now done this once, that if I were to get to fly again, it wouldn't take me a day and a half. It'd probably take me less than a day. And if I got a third flight, it's probably less than a few hours because we have flown people that many times now that we have that database. Uh, but there's no way to train for this down here. They can't put you in a room and suck out the gravity and say, okay, how you feel? You've seen pictures, you've probably seen videos of people bouncing around in an airplane. But that airplane is a carnival ride. That airplane, you get about 25 seconds of zero G, and then when the airplane pulls out, you get two Gs on the floor. So that's a carnival ride. That's not adapting to zero G. So as I said, I know this picture wasn't taken on flight day one because one of the other symptoms 
Right now, your heart is pumping more blood up so that your head gets blood. Gravity is trying to drain it out. Your, your brain needs blood to function, so your heart pumps more blood up. That's just the way we work. Well, when you first get into orbit and gravity isn't pulling the blood down, your heart pumps it up, you wind up with a fat head. I can tell every one of you, this is known, I can tell every one of you, if you went into space tomorrow, after two hours, you're going to have a fat head. What I can't tell you is, how will you feel about that? Are you going to be uncomfortable? Will you even notice? Will, you be, will it be painful? I don't know. They don't know. Well, after we were up for about an hour and a half, two hours, Pinky, one of the guys in the crew, went around with the camera and said, it's time for the fat face pictures. And, and NASA had the, the, the uh, rulers, perpendicular rulers. They put on your face. They took pictures with a good color lens. And there was a color bar on there so they could measure the color. They could measure the size. So they could estimate very specifically, OK, how much did his head swell compared to his and his and his and, and so on. And this is all part of the research that's being done on the space shuttle. So as I said, I know this wasn't on flight day one because I'm smiling. I wouldn't turn upside down because that full feeling in my head made me feel like I was hanging upside down. Now, there is no right upside down and right side up in the shuttle. I mean, you're in zero G. The physiological feeling that I had was very real. My head was swollen up, okay, which is the same feeling that comes with hanging upside down. But at least all of my visual cues were normal. If I flipped upside down in the cabin and now all my visual cues say, you're upside down, no, I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear that message. And this is one of the things they're trying to understand. And it's one of the things that I think about spaceflight. And for, for you young people, if you decide mentally, how does that affect you? Obviously, my mind was very much bothered by that. And it had nothing to do whatsoever with physiology. It was just mental. And it's part of the process. You've taken away this stimulus, this gravity, that we've grown up and evolved with, and now it's different. And how does the mind react to that? One of the questions that always comes up is food. And, and as I said, it's the same as here, only different. How many of you had a bowl of cereal this morning? I had a bowl of cereal this morning. You had space food. Yeah. Only difference between the cereal you had and the cereal we had is how is it prepared? Okay, when you prepare a bowl of cereal down here, you take a bowl, you pour the cereal in the bowl. Okay, that doesn't work in zero G. It doesn't pour. If you open a box of cereal, you got this cloud of cereal sorting around the room. But if NASA puts it in a box, and the box, if you look carefully at the boxes, you can see it looks like they have a sort of a soft plastic cover on. That's exactly what it is. And everything you need for the bowl of cereal is in there. And if you look carefully at the boxes, you can see that some of the corners, every box has a corner that's a little odd. There's a receptor in there for a needle. And you pop the needle into the galley where the meals are prepared, and a needle gets punched into the corner of the box. And then you turn the dial on the, on the, on the kitchen, and if it's cold cereal, you hit a blue button. And if I want a bowl of cereal, I probably turn the dial to four, four ounces of water, hit the blue button, and I get cold water if I want hot if I want oatmeal and I want hot water, I'll hit a yellow button, I get hot water. I now have exactly the same bowl of cereal that you had for breakfast. Only difference was, how did I get it ready? Now, I'm, I'm going to guess from some of the puzzled looks that people are thinking, okay, but how do you eat it? You're not going to suck this out of a straw, okay? Exactly the same as you do here. Young folks, do not do this. Your parents will get upset with me. If you had a bowl of cereal, if you had a bowl of oatmeal, let's go with oatmeal. Oatmeal is kind of thick, and it's, it's a good, good experiment. If you had a bowl of oatmeal, picked it up and turned it over, what happens to the oatmeal in the bowl? Falls out. falls out. Of course it falls out. Stupid question. Is the bowl going to be clean, or is something going to stick to the bowl? Something's going to stick. In space, it all sticks. Once you've got the cereal wet, once you've added the liquid to it, you can take a pair of scissors and cut the soft plastic cover, and as long as you're careful and peel the plastic back carefully, the cereal sticks in the box. You can put a spoon in it. The cereal sticks to the spoon. You can eat it exactly the same as you do here, only carefully. If I had a bowl of cereal down here, I would certainly be careful not to tip it because it would spill. In space, you can take that bowl of cereal, go like this, and let go of it. And it's going to hang in the cabin, and nothing's going to happen. What I don't want to do in space is take the bowl of cereal and go like this, because it's not made sticky. 
it's not going to stick to the bowl. If I went like this, I'm probably going to have this trail of cereal behind me and an empty bowl over here. So as long as I move it carefully, I can take that bowl of cereal, I can eat it, scrambled eggs, corn, ground beef and barbecue sauce. The menu is five pages long. Wow. If it's a drink, we had coffee, we had tea, we had orange juice. You take the box and where the needle came out, now instead of cutting the plastic off, you stick a straw in there, the straw with a hard plastic tip, and you drink it out of the straw, and it's like having a sandwich bag filled with a drink. And the sandwich bag just collapses on itself, and you can eat or drink anything in space you can here. The only difference is, how do you get it ready? Cooking it is the challenge. It's all prepared on the ground and then taken into orbit that way. And when we go to Mars, when we do those kinds of things, that's another problem we're going to have to solve. But, but you can physically eat or drink anything in space you can here. Only difference is, how do you get it ready? And here, as you can see, some junk food. And we did have junk food on the shuttle. Those are pastries, and you can see the package back there, exactly the same as the stuff you get out of a vending machine. Only in space, your hands don't have to get sticky because you don't have to touch it. I mean, you can just peel the plastic off, take the plastic, put it in a tray, let it float in the cabin, and come back and eat it out of the air. Your hands never need to touch the food. I talked about the bathroom. I'm sure you all recognize the bathroom. I'm surprised I didn't get a giggle out of somebody. The question always comes up, how do you go to the bathroom in space? And again, exactly the same as you do here. If you look carefully, you can see what looks like a handle right here. And there's another one on the other side that you can't see because of this canister. That's not a handle. NASA does not expect you to sit there and hold yourself down while you're going to the bathroom. There is a spring in that handle, and when you position yourself on the seat, and that's the secret, positioning yourself over that opening, because that opening is kind of small, and you may think you know yourself, but... Yeah, a... So you position yourself over the seat, you pull the handle up, turn it over your leg, and the spring pulls down gently, one on each leg, and you're now on the seat. And the, and the next question obviously becomes, okay, but what takes the stuff away from you in zero G? And the answer is air. There are openings around the outside of the seat, and there's a fan down inside that draws air through those openings. And that air moving down into the bowl is enough to draw the stuff away from you, and it goes down into the bowl, it's damp, it sticks to the outside of the bowl, it works very well. You clean, it, you clean up after you're done, into the bowl, exactly the same thing. Now for the different part. We didn't flush anything. The only thing we dumped in space was water. After you're done going to the bathroom, there is a, a series of, of instruments and switches on the side. Uh, my wife was aghast to find that the paper to learn to use the bathroom was a quarter of an inch thick. These are all the procedures. And, uh -huh. I'll go into that. After you're done, you close, you see this ball, you slide that ball forward, and a metal plate slides across just below the seat. You sealed off that volume. You then open another valve to space, and you let the air out. You didn't dump the material, you let the air out. You've taken advantage of the vacuum of space to sterilize it. You kill the bacteria, you kill the germs. So you don't have a health problem, you don't have an odor problem. Now there is a checklist for going to the bathroom. Because think about the things that I just described. Okay, now I come in to use the bathroom. There's a vacuum in that bowl. I can't go to the bathroom there. So the first thing you have to do is you have to close the vent from space. Check it off. I closed the vent from space. But you still got a vacuum. You may have closed the vent, but you still got a vacuum there. Okay, you open another valve to bleed air into that volume. Okay, so now you got air in that volume, but you're still not ready because you have the plate two inches from your bottom. You don't want to go to the bathroom with a plate two inches from your bottom. After you've opened the valve, you've got to turn the fan on to get the air for circulating so that that will work. Now that's all pretty simple. That's a handful of steps. But let's go back to step one. When I close the vent from space, how do I know it closed? Little pilot light says vent open, vent closed. What do you do if the pilot light doesn't work? You're in there to go to the bathroom and you think there might be a vent to space open. Okay, there's a malfunction procedure for figuring that out. Is it the power bar? Is it the light? Is it the switch? Is it the vent? Okay, let, let's say that one worked. Okay, so then I turn another one. You can get the, every time you threw one of those switches, something could go wrong, and leaving nothing to chance, NASA has a malfunction procedure to go along with every one of those. 
But the physical act of going to the bathroom is exactly the same as it is here. And if I had an opportunity to live in space station and, and do this for six months, I would have absolutely no problem whatsoever going to the bathroom in this facility. Remember I mentioned the bathroom door. If you look carefully, you can see the round structure here. That is the hatch. That's where you actually get in the vehicle. This panel, if you recall, I mentioned the bathroom door, has been propped open. It stays open for the duration of the flight. And in classic engineering fashion, the, the Columbia had been modified or refurbished before our flight so that the privacy curtains didn't fit. So we got in the vehicle and you open the door and there is nothing there for privacy. And here's the ladder right here going upstairs. So anybody upstairs is looking down into the bathroom. So this is, a, this is the trusty roll of duct tape, and you can see the duct tape, and we sacrifice one towel to have our privacy curtain hanging over the bathroom. So the system works very well, but in the end, it's seven people living in a very small space, doing the best they can to be comfortable. This is sleeping in space. As I said, I can sleep anywhere, anytime, in any situation, so this was, was not difficult for me. Uh, you'll notice he's wearing a mask. One of the misperceptions that we have in, of, of life in space or of living in space is that it's dark. We've seen way too many science fiction movies and it's always dark outside. You'd have to work really, really hard to keep it dark on the space shuttle or in anything in low Earth orbit. It's going around the world every hour and a half. So if this young man here right in the middle were the sun, okay, and my, wor my fist is the world, this is the space shuttle. Can you see my, the space shuttle now? No, you can't because it's behind my hand, right? So it's in darkness. And if I come around here, can you see it now? So it's in daylight. Oop, back in darkness. Oops, sunlight. You go around the world every hour and a half. The sun rises and sets every hour and a half. If you wanted to, if I went around the world like this, there are very particular orbits that you can go to that will stay in the sunlight but you can't stay in darkness. You never have more than 30 minutes of darkness in low Earth orbit. We had about, for our orbit, we had about 20 minutes of darkness. So during the sleep period, during the eight hour sleep period, the sun would rise and set four or five times. Now they had shades to put over the windows, but what we did for fun was look out the windows. I mean, if you woke up in the middle of the night, you can't order out for pizza, so what do you do? You go look out the window. And, and particularly on a six-day mission, I had the opportunity once to speak with a Russian cosmonaut who was up for eight months, and I asked him when he got bored, when he got tired of being in space. And he said after about six months, he was ready to come home. He had seen enough of the world. And I've told people, I would like to stay long enough to find out when I got tired of looking out the window. I, looked, I stayed up all night one night, and for eight hours, I looked out the window. We went around the world five times, and it was absolutely amazing. So yeah, what we did for fun was look out the windows. We didn't want to cover them. So NASA provided each crew member with a mask so that you could just cover your eyes while you were sleeping. And that worked very well. This is sleeping. This is not the normal sleeping mode. He is simply tethered to the wall with a Walkman. The older folks here will remember a Walkman when you actually tended those things. Uh, there was a sleep restraint that you could use to keep yourself from bouncing around. That was what Pinky was wearing on the, was using the last time. Uh, the night that I stayed up all night to, uh, to look out the window, the following night I was so tired I didn't want to use my sleep restraint, so I just Velcroed myself to the wall, and I hung <laughs> myself on the wall while I was to, to sleep. And that worked very well until I pulled away from the Velcro, and then I was just floating around the cabin to sleep. So you can, as I said, it's, it's interesting because this is part of the space adaptation. It, what, I remember when my daughter was young, if I would go in and tuck her in, if she was laying on her back, I said, no, come on, roll over. You're not going to fall asleep on your back. Some people have to sleep on their sides. Some people like to sleep on their stomach. Some people like to sleep, sleep on their, uh, you know, curled up in a ball. Uh, when, you go to, when you go into space, you're not sleeping on anything. You are floating in the cabin. I mean, you could strap yourself in a seat. There were only two seats that stayed up, the pilots and the commanders. But even then, you're not sitting. You're floating between the seat and the seat belt. And, and some people do have a problem. NASA provides sleeping pills for every crew member in case you need that. But as I said, I didn't have that problem at all. I, uh, after flight day one, the, the space adaptation caused me some, some grief on flight day one. But after that, sleeping was not an issue. You can see Charlie is here in his seat. And you'll notice his hands are inside his sleep restraint. 
that, that's, that's sort of a, a, of a weird thing because your hands, you ha we all have a, a zero G posture, if you will, and it depends on your individual musculature and your muscle tone and how your muscles are wired. Uh, so for me, if I just floated in the cabin, my arms were sort of out here, my head act actually floated back a little bit, which was one of my symptoms of space adaptation because it was a pain in the butt. I had to hold my head forward to do anything. It wasn't difficult, it wasn't painful, it, you know, it was just a nuisance. I couldn't read without consciously holding my head down. Otherwise, it would simply float back. So when you're sleeping, most people's arms float out in front of them, and that's sort of a weird thing. You wake up in the middle of the night and there's a spare hand staring you in the face. <laughs> Taking a shower in zero G or getting clean in zero G is the one part of a shuttle ride that is not fun. Now, it is a minor inconvenience. The Apollo astronauts, for instance, I did this once with, uh, with one of the Apollo astronauts, and he compared the Apollo bag to the uh, shuttle experience. Now, I told you the bathroom, getting a, a bath, you can see there's a little hose, and there's a little nozzle at the end with a little trigger on it, and you can squirt water into a washcloth, and it'll catch the water, it'll get wet, exactly the same as it does here, just like pouring it. The water surface tension will stick. You can get it soapy, and you can see that Pinky's washing his hair, and you can see the soap in his hair and the washcloth, and that's all cool, that's fine. Now you've, you scrub it down, and you're great. Now how do you rinse it out? There is no drain. Water does not go anywhere. It's just You take this hose, you squeeze it, you squirt it into your hair, and you've got the towel, a big bath towel, and you try to rub the soap off of your hair and your body, because that's the whole routine for your whole body. And after a while, you're not removing the soap, you're sharing it with a towel. The towel gets some and you get some. And it's, I'm sure that you folks have all been to the beach, and so you know the feeling after you've been to the beach and you come out to the ocean and you haven't rinsed it off, and after about an hour and a half, you got this sticky, icky feeling because it's not really clean. That's how you feel after about two or three days on the space shuttle. It is a minor inconvenience. Uh, if you work the space station, you go into space, they have things that work in zero G, but it was the one part of a shuttle ride that was not particularly fun. We landed, immediately after you land, the first thing that happens is you get your post-flight physical. Immediately after my post-flight physical, I took a 45 minute shower because I just wanted to rinse the soap off. Many people have asked me, what is it like to see the world hanging like a little ball off in space? I have no idea. Those pictures were taken by the Apollo astronauts, the people that were here to celebrate. They were thousands of miles away on their way to the moon. When I was in orbit, when you visit space station, you're up 200, I was up 185 nautical miles, space station is up 250. The world is almost 7,000 nautical miles across. It's huge. If you look out the window, this is the kind of thing you see and, and the, the contrast isn't here is, is not particularly good and, and it, because it's upside down, it's, it's even worse. So let me try one more thing. Can anybody recognize what's in that picture from your perspective? Florida. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And the thing about low Earth orbit is, again, you're going around the world every hour and a half. This view of Florida would last about five minutes. You come up over the horizon and you see Florida off on the distance, but it's this tiny sliver of land. And oh, by the way, it's not down here. This is my earthbound thing. It's up here. And so you may recognize it, you may not. And then as you come up over it, you got about five or 10 minutes, and then you get to this kind of a perspective. And you say, okay, that's Florida. And if you have anything to do, for instance, if you're looking for some feature, and I did, um, one of my experiments was a camera looking down, you get about five or 10 minutes to look at Florida like this, and then, oh, it's over on the other horizon setting. And, and you might think, well, you'll catch it on the next round. No, you won't. Because if you think about it, I'm going around the world every hour and a half. Well, the world, the world is not standing still for that hour and a half. It's rotated by 22 and a half degrees. So the next time I come up, I'm not going to be over Florida. I'm going to be over Houston. And another rev later, I'm not going to be over Houston. I'm going to be over the, east, the eastern Pacific. And then you spend two or three revs over the, uh, the Pacific because it's a, it's a big, big ocean. So it's, and then the next time, by the time you get around to Florida again, it's going to be almost 24 hours later before you get around to Florida again. So one of the reasons why missions are planned so carefully is you have to capture those events when they come up and you have to be ready for them when they come up. 
But the one night that I stayed up and looked out all night, I, I wasn't looking for any particular events. I was just enjoying the view. So that was, a, that was a, a perk for me. This was the reason I was allowed to fly. This gold and blue cube that you see up on the top was a commercial communication satellite. It was called SATCOM KU-1. And I was the manager of systems engineering on this program, which meant technically I was responsible for the spacecraft. There were dozens of engineers who knew more about the spacecraft in their individual features than I did. But if you only got to send one person and, and help diagnose if anything went wrong, I was the logical choice for that because I was technically responsible for it. Now, we dropped that spacecraft off. As I said, we were up 185 miles. That spacecraft has to be up 19,000 miles to function. So the round part that you see attached to the bottom is a rocket motor. If you ever seen little model rocket motors you can buy in the hobby shops, they're about this big. Th that rocket motor is exactly the same as those. Different propellant and a whole lot more of it but it's the same thing, it weighs 6,000 pounds, solid rocket motor. And the timer fired that motor 40 minutes after we deployed it, and by that time we were 40 miles away, so that if anything had gone wrong, if the motor blew up, if it didn't work properly, there would have been no danger to either us or the vehicle. Finally, one of the most spectacular sights that, that, that you can imagine, and, and you really can't, picture the prettiest sunset you have ever seen or the prettiest sunrise you have ever seen, and try to imagine flying through all of those colors in about five minutes. Because you're flying through the sun's light as it's being bent by the Earth's atmosphere. Every time you come up with a sunrise, you're flying through that band of light. And every hour and a half, it repeats. And 20 minutes later, it's gonna happen when the sun sets, but you go in the other direction. And it, and it varies every time because it depends on the cloud cover and it depends on the atmospheric conditions as you're looking through the Earth's limb. And it is absolutely astounding. I have seen pictures of it, I have seen videos of it, and none of it is the same as being there. It is absolutely astounding. That is it for the slides. Okay, can you get me to the video or can I get me to the video? We're going to really tempt fate here, and I want to see if I can fly. I did that part. Oh, okay. I got a short movie to show you, and then we'll... There we go. That's good. I've got a very short video to show you, and... You'll notice we're coming out of a building. Some of the older folks here might recall when they used to have a backup crew. They didn't have backup crews for shuttle missions. What they did was we were kept in isolation for the last week before the flight. No one was allowed to visit me except my wife, and she was given a physical, so they knew she, didn't, she wasn't sick, that she wasn't gonna give me some bug that I was gonna, so my kids, my parents, no, nope, off limits. Uh, she was the only one allowed to see me. We got on the vehicle about Two hours before, as I said, we got into the crew cabin, so you're hanging there for a couple of hours. As I said, it's loud. When they light the main engines, you feel it. You feel the noise going through you. Then they light the solids. That's when you actually start to move. Then you find out what noise is, because the engines, main engines are turbines. They're smooth. The rockets are just ratty. They're just hissy, noisy beasts. I looked out the side window, the hatch window, and I watched the gantry move. Because I'm not a pilot, I'm an engineer, I am not used to doing this kind of thing in an airplane. All I felt was the noise. Because I started off hanging on the wall, as a vehicle turned over and fly, flies down range, you're actually hanging from the ceiling. You've got a seat belt and two shoulder straps on. Now because you're being pressed into your seat by the motor, by the acceleration of the motor, you don't feel like you're upside down. You do feel like you're sliding up in your seat. It's, it's a very strange feeling. The ride up takes about eight minutes. After about two minutes, the solids fall away, and, and we had what was apparently one of the most spectacular launches of, of the shuttle program, launching into the sun. And you can see the solids falling away there. Now it's smooth. You're above most of the Earth's atmosphere, the solids have fallen away, the visors go up, and, and, and I, downstairs, didn't have any responsibilities, settled in for the ride up. And so I just literally, for the next six minutes, six minutes sat in my seat and just felt myself getting heavier and heavier and heavier. The last minute of the flight, two minutes of the flight, felt like I weighed about three times what I weigh here. You only pulled three Gs in the shuttle, so I felt like I weighed about 500 pounds, which sounds like a lot, but it's not a military fighter pilot might feel a lot more than that. This is upstairs again, and you can see the, the windows, and 
Charlie is doing, running through a checklist. You can see how bright it is in the sunlight. As I said, you got to work real hard to get it dark in, in the space. Here is Steve, and he's coming up. I showed you where the ladder is. There's an opening on the other side where they don't even put a ladder because you don't need one. And he's floating from downstairs to upstairs. These are the overhead windows, which I didn't mention. This is looking back on those back windows that I mentioned, and that's in the payload bay. My satellite is actually inside that cocoon. We're getting ready to deploy my satellite. The, the flight crew actually set relays and turned things on to spin it up, and you'll see it going in a minute. And that's spinning because that rocket motor is, is, is very dangerous at 6,000 pounds of explosives. By spinning it, it's like a top. It will essentially remain fixed in space. So they oriented the shuttle in the direction it needed to be pointed, and by spinning it and popped it out, it just moved, and it just floated. And for me, it was a, it was a real trip because... I had worked on that spacecraft for two years, and here's Steve looking out the overhead window, and we watched the satellite for about 20 minutes, and it just drifted further and further away, and after about 20 minutes, it drifted into darkness. And, and so then we couldn't see it anymore, and we then, who, the commander actually reoriented the satellite and then backed it away, so it would be even further away when the engine actually fired. Here we are, yeah, you can see that it's, it's still moving away as it, uh, as it drifts from the, from the orbiter. Here is that overhead window, and again, you can see here the size of the world under the shuttle. And this is a tropical island out in the Pacific Ocean, and you can see sometimes they're, they're rel relatively difficult to see because they're tropical islands. They're, they're blue-green, the water is blue-green, and sometimes you, can't, you have a hard time seeing them. On the other hand, you've got the eastern coast of Africa, and you've got desert, and, and that was easy to see. And we had a really great mission. We were relatively cloud-free. Uh, there were a few times that, that were inconvenient for me personally that there were things that we couldn't see, but it was a great mission for looking down. This is one of the boxes of orange juice, and if you don't drink the orange juice, if you just let it float in the cabin, then we did play with our food. <laughs> this is downstairs. You can see the lockers over here. This is back upstairs, and we're, this is part of the actual deployment. If you look carefully, you can see some feet on the ceiling over here. That was me. This is one of my experiments. I, I loved zero-G. People have asked me what was the best part, and I'm not sure whether it was looking out the window or zero gravity, but I had this fascination with turning sideways. I have no idea why. I've never been a gymnast, so it's not like I'm a tumbler, but it was just amazing for me to be able to do this. And here is Franklin up on the flight deck, and you can see the windows, and the back windows are looking out the back, and you can see again how bright it is, and you typically keep cameras. The night I stayed up all night, I had a camera on one, Velcro to the ceiling on one side, and I had the uh, box of coffee sitting next to me on the other side while we were going around. Now, I mentioned zero G, and you have to get used to this. If you look here, you can see who's come down from the flight deck, and Bill Nelson is over here, but he's not in a way of Bill Hoot, because Hoot doesn't have to come down to the floor. He just needed a tissue to clean the windows before he took some pictures. He just floats across the ceiling, reaches the tissue, and goes back upstairs. Now, that works very well, but you have to get used to it, and you have to be careful. In the next scene, Pinky and I are fixing some equipment that wasn't working, and if you look really carefully, you can see the batteries that we just left floating out in the room in front of us. Well, that's fine, but it's not really very smart, because all you have to do is brush against it, and it's gone. You don't even know you've touched it, and it's gone away. And if you look carefully, somebody found these batteries up on the flight deck and, and just floated them back down to us. So you have to be careful in zero-G in different ways, and it's all part of, of getting used to working in zero-G. This is a can of fruit cocktail. I talked about the food and the oatmeal. Fruit cocktail is the same thing. You open a can of fruit cocktail, and it sticks in the can. Only this... <laughs> If the spoon gets away from you, you have to follow the spoon across the room if you're going to eat the fruit cocktail. And this is a, a meal for the entire crew. And there's a little oven in the galley where the meals are prepared to keep them hot. And you can see the boxes. And the boxes just sort of squeeze into the trays so they don't float away. The trays are Velcroed to the wall of lockers. You can see the wall of lockers. And it works very well. Got a little bit of a tour. We're going to go up the ladder. You can see we're going to, we're going to cross the ceiling and then down the other side. As we come up through the opening of the floor, we've gone up the ladder, you'll notice that Pinky and Steve are sitting. They're not sitting. They're just propped between the back wall and the, floor, and the seat, and it's enough to keep him from floating away. His tray is literally strapped to his leg to keep it from floating away. 
Hoot was on the treadmill, so he was down in his walking shorts because it got warm. We're now looking down from the flight deck down to the other side, and this is cleaning up the cabin. Now, I don't like cleaning any more than the next guy does, but in zero G, it's kind of interesting. And the next time you take out a vacuum cleaner, look at that long vacuum cleaner ho uh, cable, and imagine it's not laying on the floor. Imagine it's just floating in zero G. That's a TV cable, and it's literally about 20 feet long, so you can snake it through the cabin, and we've got to pack it up to bring it home. So Steve is packing it up and trying to coil it up when it doesn't lay on the floor to put it in the box. <laughs> now you may notice that he wasn't moving. The reason he wasn't moving, I think I mentioned those loops of canvas that you have taped to the floor, and his toes are, are in the, one of those loops so that it keeps him from moving. But after you're adapted to zero G, those loops are just convenient handholds. In the next scene, we're fixing, cleaning up. So if you're working near the floor, there's no reason to bend down. Gravity isn't pulling you down. You just go down and your feet wind up up on the ceiling. And here I am with a former NASA administrator scrubbing walls. <laughs> this is again another attempt at a sunrise. And as I said, the pictures don't do it justice. We landed out at Edwards Air Force Base in the wee hours of the morning. And after six days of flight, you don't lose your strength. Six days is not enough to lose your strength, but you have adapted to weightlessness. So you have to readapt. You'll notice most of the people when we're coming down the stairs afterwards, you stay in the vehicle about a half an hour before, after you've landed. You'll notice coming down the stairs that most people are holding on with at least one hand, if not two. It's not because you're weak, it's because you haven't thought about it. If I step off, if I just put my foot out over this step, my mind goes on alert because it knows I'm one step away. Your mind doesn't do that after six days in zero G. If I stumbled coming down those stairs, my mind would not catch me. My mind would think, you're gonna float away and I'd fall down the stairs. <laughs> we landed Saturday morning. Sunday morning, I went to brush my teeth. I took the lid off the toothpaste and dropped it and reached up like this. Because <laughs> that's where I expected the toothpaste lid to be. Now, fortunately, we adapt very quickly coming back because we had 37 years of growth behind us. So the readaptation process is very quick. Uh, and again, for the young people here, these are the kinds of things that you can sort through and figure out if and when you decide you want to go into space because there's so much more than just the engineering. The engineering is the fun part. That's what I do. Uh, but there are so many life sciences things, psychological things. Uh, they've done archaeology from space. People have literally looked down from space at the jungle who knew archaeology and said, look at that. There was a pattern they could see that indicated there was something under the ground, under the jungle, and they literally found something like that. I have no idea. So. All right, that's all I have. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. So. You mean in space? No, just... Just had a blizzard in... Yeah, I've had a blizzard from Derek. Yeah, okay. Is that like being able to turn it upside down? Oh, yeah. It's like the same thing? That's exactly, it's exactly the same thing. It's surface tension. Yeah, and, and the only question is, how would you prepare it? If you literally flew a machine to prepare the blizzard in space, a blizzard in space would actually be the same as it is here. That's a really good example. It's, it's just a convection oven because the microwave, they, they thought about using a microwave, but they, the broadband interference with all of the electronics on the, on the shuttle they thought might be a problem. It was just easier to put a convection oven in because you're not really cooking in it. You don't need the kind of heat that you need with a microwave. All you're doing is putting a box in. And if you wanted the box of food, for instance, if I had scrambled eggs and I wanted them warm, well, I'd start off with warm water. So I'd have warm water to start with, and the only thing the convection oven is doing is keeping it warm. Yes. Yeah. It's, it does. Yeah. It does not rise. Yeah. One of the one of the fascinating things is talking about the uh, the oven and heat rising is flame in space. It's one of the huge issues or things they struggle with uh, because they want to understand that. If you stop and think about it, when you when you light a match, the flame rises because the hot air and that sucks in more air, and that continues the flame. So in space, what happens? A lot of matches will self extinguish because they'll use up all of the oxygen around them and it won't get sucked in enough to maintain combustion. 
But nobody is, really wants to count on that. They want to understand it. And so they've conducted very, very carefully controlled experiments on flame propagation in zero G because it's probably part of the naval heritage, if you will. Nobody wants to talk about a fire in that kind of enclosed vehicle. And so the same thing goes in space. And then when some puts the theory that, well, it, it won't burn in space. Well, yeah, it'll burn, but it's a limited burn. And, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of questions there. And as I said, we've got a lot of work to do to understand it. What inspired me to become an engineer? I love to build things. I just, you go around the museum here, and if you see the World War I airplanes that are built out of wood and covered with, with cables connecting them together, man, I just look at that and I start drooling. I, I want to build one of those. That would be cool. I love to build things. When I was growing up, you know, Legos, uh, and when I was growing up, there were erector sets. And I just love to build things. And God gave me a good head for math, so engineering seemed to be a logical choice. I got a young man up there. Dad, can you help him out if I can't hear him? He wants me to ask. Sure. From Earth, and you look up, you see clouds, and you can see different shapes and pictures and things. From space, what, is, what do the clouds look like? Do you see the same sort of shapes? Or what do clouds look like when you look at them from space? Do you get the same thing? That, that's interesting. I've never really thought of that. I, I loved looking out the window. You know what I, I enjoyed looking out uh, from space with the clouds? Were the shadows. Because you don't think about that, and your perspective as you fly over them changes. And so the shadows change a lot. And the, what I said about sunrises and sunset, there were times when if there were high clouds, you'd actually see the sun come up under the clouds, through the clouds, and then over the clouds, which was kind of cool. So I would guess that you can probably see the same kind of shapes, but I don't remember anything like that from when I was up. How do you dissipate the heat without air from the launch? You don't have to on the launch. You're expelling it in the energy of the, of the engines. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that's what makes reentry such a problem, is you don't have. If you could expend as much fuel coming home as you did going up, you wouldn't have the thermal problems on reentry. You have to dissipate all that energy. And in orbit, uh, if you don't know the reason, the shuttle actually flies upside down most of the time. And the reason they fly upside down is for thermal. The inside of the shuttle's payload bay doors are radiators. Now, if those radiators, if you were simply going around, and sometimes they saw sun, and sometimes they saw dark, and sometimes it, then they would get very hot, absorbing the sun's heat, and then looking at deep space, they would get very cold. And so you would not have a very stable thermal environment. So by flying upside down, those radiators are always looking at a 15 degrees C Earth. The Earth, on average, is about 15 degrees C, and I apologize, I don't remember what that is in Fahrenheit. But it's a good, stable sink, and that's why, they had to, that's why they flew that way. If they couldn't open the payload bay doors, the shuttle would have to come back home. They had to have those. That's one of the things people, most people don't know. They had to have those shuttle doors open, and that was one of the first things that you did when you got in space was open those payload bay doors, because if you couldn't, you were coming home. You have a bad day. <laughs> there were, there were literally, there were, there were only two spacesuits on the vehicle. There were seven people on our crew. There were two spacesuits on the vehicle for emergencies. If anything came up, they had to go outside. Pinky, uh, I think, no, that was me. I think Steve and, and Franklin were the two EVA astronauts, so suits were designated for them. If you couldn't get the payload bay doors open, one of the procedures was they would literally put on the spacesuits, go back out into the payload bay door through the overlocks, and hand crank them to bring them back in. Because, that was, as I said, you have to be redundant. So if those motors, and I'm pretty sure there were two motors, but if, if even both of those motors failed, you really don't want to have a crew stranded in orbit that way. So there were literally hand cranks to do that. Do you ever dream, um, or have you dreamt, that you was back in space? I don't dream very often, so the answer is no. We about the engineering of the shuttle. I felt like the launch was going to be an issue, but you know, we just. What do you mean, the launch mechanism? The way they, you know, because the shuttle, one of the things I couldn't understand was when they designed the space shuttle launch mechanism. Right? If you remember the Apollo missions, you saw the ice fall down. Mm hmm. 
Because, uh, well, yes and no. Well, the question is, what about the engineering on the shuttle, and particularly the launch and the ice and, the, and, it, and from Apollo? Well, the ice is caused by the cryogenic propellants. But if you, if you, re, if you think about it, the, the problem that you're, you're referring to, it obviously was a problem. It cost, it's cost us a vehicle and, 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 and lives. Uh, the shuttle launched many, many times without that. They had changed the adhesive, and it wasn't just the ice. It was the tiles. It was the uh, insulation coming off. And the insulation came off because they changed the adhesive. And, and I don't, I, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not laying blame. The, the fact of the matter is the reason the insulation started falling off was they changed the adhesive because of the environmental impact of the adhesive. The, the, the adhesive worked fine and it was, it was not a problem. And, and quite frankly, and, and this I'll be candid about, I don't think there was enough adhesive used on the shuttle program to have caused an environmental problem. But in fact, that was the reason they changed the adhesive. So the first 40, 50, 60 flights of the shuttle program, they never had an issue with the adhesive coming off. Uh, they changed the adhesives, and that's when they started to lose the, uh, the foam. And it was the, the water-soaked foam that, that, that caused the Columbia accident. But there were lots of other things. It, it's, it reminds me of, of the bad call in a football game that everybody gets upset about. And I'll be the first to admit, I'm one of them. Uh, but there are 60 minutes in a game, and you had 59 minutes and probably 50 seconds without that penalty where the team could have changed the outcome. It's part of the game. So, you know, you, uh, you, you, you play the hand you're dealt. And there was an original shuttle where you had it on top, you had the shuttle, you know, lower. Oh, that was the, you, oh, you're talking about the fundamental design of the stack. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the uh, I think the original rubbing design. Yeah. yeah. There, there are a lot of trades that go into that. When you, when you talk about that, he's talking about the original concept had the shuttle the sitting on the, the flight vehicle. Let me not call it the shuttle, the flight orb of the flight vehicle sitting on top of the stack. You, you have some very serious loads issues now because when you launch a vehicle, it, it tends to oscillate due to the aerodynamic loads. So if you have a vehicle like that with an attachment, when you start to swing it, imagine you had a... Uh, a flexible wire and you go like this. The longer it is, the more it's going to flex, the more it's going to wiggle back and forth, and the more loads there are going to be on it. So the stronger you have to make it. And, and one of the, one of the in interesting challenges about working in the space business, and it's one of the things that I love, is it's all about precision and trade-offs. You have to do that as best you can. I also worked in the nuclear industry for a, for a year. And in the nuclear industry, their answer to anything was add more metal. <laughs> and the forging is nine inches thick. It's going to break. Make it ten inches. That'll do it. The biggest problem we had is the crane big enough to lift it? Yeah, if I can lift it, I can build it. Uh, in the aerospace business, everything is about precision. I, I once worked with a program, and we proof, we test everything. We test everything everything in the space business. So they take the fuel tank, and to make sure the fuel tank won't break, they take one fuel tank and they load it to burst. They literally pressurize it until it explodes. And there are predictions for when that's going to happen. Let's say the prediction was 4,000 PSI, and it went to 6,000 PSI, and the guy says, that was a great test, and the program manager says, no it ain't, it's too heavy. It was too beefy. It didn't need to go to 6,000. Its maximum expected operating pressure was 2,500. So we were testing it at 4,000 to make sure we had margins. If we tested it to 6,000 before it burst, it was too heavy. And that's the business I'm in. And, and it's one of the things I love about the business that I'm in. It's not, it's, it's about precision. Who designs the patch? The crew designs the patch. The flight crew designs the patch. Although as a payload specialist, since I came in from the outside, I didn't get a vote on it, which was fine with me. I'm, I'm very happy with the patch they came up with. I heard recently that they're planning to go to the moon Yes. Yeah, I, I can argue the date, but yeah, they're planning on going to the moon again. And I endorse that for the record. <laughs> No, no. Right now, I'm working on an Air Force satellite. Most of my most of my career has been working on satellites. Most of them commercial. This happens to be an Air Force program. 
What is the most stressful part of the mission? Coming home. And, not, and that's actually from a couple of perspectives. That's, that's psychological. And, and it's sort of like, you know, you're coming back from vacation. You've had a great week on vacation. You're driving home and you're sitting in traffic and you think, oh, God, don't let anything go wrong now. I had a great week. And, and in addition, you're far too young to remember, but some of the folks in the room will remember reentry. What eventually happened to Columbia is, is, in my mind, every bit as dangerous as launch. And, and I was not worried at launch. To be very honest with you, I think that was sort of like thinking that if anything happens to me, I'm never going to know what happened to me, so that's the end of that. But on re-entry, for 20 minutes, you're, you're passing through the Earth's atmosphere, and, and my dad and I would sit and watch, and, and for 20 minutes, they'd go in a blackout, and you never knew if they were coming out. And, and I, I was nervous on re-entry. And I, as a, I was a passenger, so I had nothing to do with it. I'm just sitting there listening to the call out. So, okay, we're doing Mach 25, and the vehicle starts shaking. I said, we got some turbulence in the jet stream up here. I said, that's great. I needed to hear that. <laughs> Sir? Radiation exposure in the shuttle? They, it's interesting, I'm a part of an experiment on the long-term effects of space flight, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the theories in terms of radiation specific is that there might be a, a relationship between early onset cataracts and, and space flight. And when the doctor told me that, I said, I don't think you can use me as a reference point for that, because I did have early onset cataracts. But so did my father, so did my grandfather, so did my uncle. So, you know, and the issue, I think the thing is, you just need a lot of data points for something like that. So there, there are some, some quirks, if you will. Uh, they asked me when I came back if I saw any flashes at night and, and when you close your eyes and go to sleep uh, because apparently some astronauts have reported that and they don't know whether it's cosmic rays just literally lighting up uh, molecules in your retina. And I've told you everything I know about it. <laughs> All the way up on top. How do you use the restroom? How do you use the restroom? The same as you do down here. You take your turn, you get in line, and you make sure that it's working when you go in. There's only one, and there were seven of us. And I'll tell you, that's tough on flight day one. You wind up going to the bathroom a lot on flight day one. It turns out that you, you lose about 36 ounces of fluid when you go into space. You're, that's one of the metabolic things that happens. And you go to pee a lot. And, and so literally, I, my own personal theory, and I've not discussed this with one of the doctors, is, is when you go pee, you don't have the weight of your organs pressing down in your bladder. So you're relieved. You feel, okay, I'm done. Huh? No, you're not. <laughs> you go away and 15 minutes later, I gotta go pee again. So it's, it's, it's one of those anecdotal things. I have no idea if there's a uh, basis in fact to that, but that's my theory. Can you, can you re-enter it slower or lower? I've, I've thought about that. The, the problem is orbital flight. The problem is orbital flight. You start your descent from 25,000 miles an hour, 17,000 feet per second. Okay. The only way to slow that down, and if you could, you would, is more fuel. More fuel is weight. That's, no, no, they, SpaceX, and this is one of the concerns that I have with SpaceX, is one of the things that I have never seen SpaceX publicly document is how much fuel penalty they am, they am, absorb by doing their re-entry. They're using rocket engines to slow themselves down. So that means they're carrying fuel with them, they're accelerating it from standing still to whatever, the, and then they're using that fuel to slow themselves down to land. One of the reasons they went to land on a barge out at the ocean was if you stop and think about it, okay, they launch here from the Cape, they're going back to here, okay, now they drop off the first stage. If they're going back to the Cape, they have to reverse it and spend fuel to come back to the Cape. 
And then when they come back to the Cape, they have to have enough reserve fuel to make sure they can satisfy range safety because you don't want to land with zero fuel. If you land with zero fuel and you've screwed up, you're going to crash and who knows where you're going to land. So the easier solution is to simply let yourself drop and then land on a ship, which has its own set of problems. And as I said, aerospace engineering is about precision. It's a fine game to play. Uh, so yeah, it's one of the system trades. But when you're coming back from zero, from when you're coming back from orbit, uh, you're at 25,000 feet per second or miles per hour, and the only choice you have is to either expend fuel or to use the atmosphere to break. And if the atmosphere is breaking you, you're generating heat. You gotta, you gotta extract all the energy that you pumped in on the way up. You have to dissipate coming back down. And that's what all the radiators do. Is they're literally radiating all the heat, all that energy that you pumped in to get yourself into space has got to go somewhere. It's got to go somewhere. That's basically. You can have flaps. You can do anything you want, but you're still going to dissipate heat. Not, you're going to slow it down, but you're going to dissipate heat. If if you don't use propellant, if you don't use propellant, you're 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 sloughing off energy. Mm-hmm. No. No, I don't, I, the one thing that was memorable about that is you go from 3 G's to zero. Because you're accelerating at 3 G's, you're getting pressed into your seat with 3 G's, and now suddenly it's gone. And so I'm sitting in my seat, I'm in the downstairs seat, I'm not doing anything, and all of a sudden my harnesses and everything are floating out in front of me, my head, which was being pressed into the seat, floats up off the seat, my arms are floating up in front of me, and I'm in zero G. It was amazing. Have you done the shuttle simulation ride at the uh, Space Center? What did you think of it? The shuttle launch experience at the Kennedy Space Center, we were invited down when they opened that ride. They wanted to fill it with astronauts, and they did. And without exception, every astronaut that was on that vehicle said, that's as close as you will come without going. The, uh, the simulation, I mean, the reason they build Six Degree of Freedom simulators is it's an they've done an amazing job of being able to trick your mind. Because, I mean, when you're in the seat, are you familiar with what he's talking about? Okay, when you're in that seat, you're not feeling anything more than 1G. And yet, they, they sort of squeeze the seat just a little bit, and it feels like you feel more than 1G. And it's all in your head. It's like the business that I said about seeing things upside down. So they do a really great job of that. Uh, yeah, I've been on that a couple of times. It's... I don't know whether you noticed, the voice on the end of the, the voice, and not, I don't know what it is now, was Charlie Bolden, my pilot. One more question. Anybody have? Uh, there we go. Um, you mentioned the bathroom that you evacuated to space to sanitize. So technically, you're losing atmosphere in, That's in correct. the shuttle. And that can, for six days, I guess you could, you could live with that. Yeah. What, what are they doing in the International Space, shuttle, space Station when they're up there for, for months or years? They have, they have a much larger volume, and one of the things that the resupply, the question was when I had talked about emptying the, uh, venting the bathroom, uh, you're losing some quantity of air. And obviously you have a fixed quantity of air, and that's, that's very true. And on the space shuttle, that's considered an expendable, and we normally carried enough expendables. There were oxygen and fuel t and propellant tanks inside the orbiter in that structure between the walls of the cabin, the, the payload bay, and the walls, so there were extra. And we carried enough expendables for two, two or three days longer than your nominal mission. So my nominal mission was supposed to be five days. I'm pretty sure it's three. We carried enough expendables for eight. And obviously, if you had a problem, the first thing you would do is cut back on your expendables. I mean, we can all live on a lot less than we normally live on. Uh, as far as space station goes, one of the things the resupply missions do is they literally take up bottles of compressed air. And, and oxygen and the kinds of things that are expendables, all of the things that are expendable. So that's part of the resupply process. Okay. Thank you very much. We thank you for the audience. I hope you enjoyed the museum.